In the heart of the city which gave us the greatest band of them all is the underground cellar where it all began. The cabin was the making of the Beatles, and the Beatles were the making of the cabin. This is the story of the most famous club in the world. As I walked towards the cabin, the beat actually hit me in the heart. An iconic venue whose fame couldn't save it from demolition. I mean, you couldn't believe it. The cavern would have been in America. It would have been a shrine. A place where a host of legends have performed. Playing the cavern was quite special for us. But whose name will always be best remembered as the birthplace of the Beatles. To see the Beatles, it was just skull shattering. You could lean across and touch them. We'd seen Elvis, but that was the movies, that was America, that was another world. This was ours, was on our doorstep in my hometown. February the 9th, 2011, marks the 50th anniversary of the day that a band with no record contract and not many fans pulled up into Liverpool's Matthew Street, gingerly descended the 18 steps into a sweaty, smelly cellar and played the cavern for the very first time. Over the next two and a half years, the Beatles would tread the cramped cavern stage nearly 300 times. By the time they finally said goodbye to the place, Beatlemania had swept Britain and the Fab Four were about to conquer the planet. We count ourselves lucky because for, what, seven pence as it were, we could not only see the Beatles but hear them sing as well. The cavern is a crucial part of the legend of the four Liverpool lads who shook the world. But what was it like to witness history in the making? I came down here and never seen anything like it in my life. I'm in town and, you know, this is the den of iniquity. My mum used to call it. It was hot and sweaty and very dark. I mean, you didn't have, you know... It was a death trap, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, it was a sweaty place, you know, but that's what rock and roll was about in those days. You know, that's why we loved it. The very first thing that would hit me when I went to the cabin was probably the smell. It was this mixture of rotting fruit from the warehouses above upstairs, urine from the toilets, which weren't the best in the world. Smoke, the hot dogs, and the disinfectant they threw down the next day to get rid of the smell. Whenever I think of the cavern, I never think of how great the kids were, how good the sound wasn't. I mention the cavern, and I immediately think, that'll. And the smell lingered on your clothes. You'd be on a bus going home, and then somebody would get up and uh, sit in front of you, and you just go like that, and you go, she's been the cavern. There are places I remember all my life, though some have changed. The cavern started out as a Victorian fruit warehouse and served as an air raid shelter during the war before opening as a jazz club in 1957. The, the Quarrymen, a skiffle band formed by a teenage John Lennon, played there in this early incarnation. Because skiffle come out of jazz, they sort of tolerated skiffle. Yeah, it was regarded as a form of jazz, so it was tolerated <clears throat> in the cavern. But it was in 1961, by which time the Quarrymen had evolved into the Beatles and the cavern had become a rock and roll hotbed, that this basement in a Liverpool back street started to become a place where people's lives could change forever. The first time we came down, we came down to see another band called Dale Roberts and the Jaywalkers because we heard that he could sing like Cliff Richard and the band could play like the Shadows. So we saw them and when we got up to get out, they said, this other band's coming on now called The Beatles. He didn't speak when he came on, he just started singing straight away. 
He was so loud and the whole sound was so different. And the Beatles came on and I, I wanted to be in that band. I wanted to be in a band like them. I wanted to play here. They were such a hard, driving, virile kind of force on a stage, you know, and that was very attractive to, to everybody who saw it. Early 60s Liverpool was awash with hopeful young groups playing American cover versions. But almost instantly, the firm favourites of the Cavern regulars were the scruffy quartet with a terrible pun in their band name and no obvious lead singer. A lot of the people who came, if they didn't like George, it didn't matter because they liked Paul. And if they didn't like Paul, they would like John. And if they didn't like John, they would like George. You know, it was uh, three lead singers. Lennon's voice, I remember particularly, that pleading voice, Dizzy Dizzy Miss Lizzie, which he just sort of tore apart as a song, really. John, very sort of sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek, but friendly. Paul was, as ever, PR. None of the group would be fluttering his eyelashes at all the girls. Even though John was the leader on stage and cracking gags and things like that, Paul was really the, the singer. He could do all Little Richard songs. To hear Paul rip into Long Tall Sally and stuff like that, you know, I did, geez, where did that voice come from? And completing the classic early Cavern era Beatles lineup of John, Paul, George, and Pete. Mean, moody, magnificent, Pete Best. I mean, he was a hell of a loud bass drummer, and he just used to lock in with McCartney's bass. The sound that they had, Pete was very, very crucial to that sound. And that was the sound that made them so popular here. He was moody, he didn't speak, he didn't ever say anything. He was just shy, wasn't he? He yeah. shy. He sort of looked down under his eyes at you and always oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. It was just definitely a James Dean situation, you know, where girls would just wait for him to smile and he never did. In those days I had to crank out a solid beat. If the girls were trying to make me smile, you know, it was... I had my head down, I'm concentrating on what I'm doing. Now and again, I give a little grin. A special bond was formed between the four Beatles and the teenagers paying to see them. And that was cemented in the informal atmosphere of the now legendary Cavern lunchtime sessions. Cha -cha -boo. Pesame, pesame and it was great because the kids would come from work in the lunch break come down here and have a hot dog and a, and a coke. So, besame, besame they played two spots. It was 12 to 1, and then close past 1 to close past 2. And the best spot was the second spot. So I was trying to, to get my lunch a little bit late. And I would dash, run from where I worked, and um, got down here watched the show, tried to hang around as long as I could at the end, but shouted at the coffee bar at the back. And it was very, very relaxed because you could just shout up to them and ask them to play different numbers and they messed about on stage. Money don't get everything it's due. The thing about the cavern was because it was a small place, because it was where the in crowd used to go, and all the same people used to go there all the time. I reckon I must have seen the Beatles maybe 100, 150 times. The interaction with the fans, the chassis, they knew everyone's name. You really did know that you were watching history being made. You knew that something incredible was going to have to happen. You didn't know then that it was going to be something that was going to touch the whole of the world and change things forever. The Mersey Beach scene was about to explode. There were 350 groups. And this, the cavern, this became their, their temple, their holy of holies. But some would be left behind. The reality of the situation hit me. Good God, I'm no longer with the band. That's what I want. I got the hippie, hippie 
It's 50 years since the Beatles played for the first time at the Liverpool club that will always be connected with their name, the Cavern. But as well as hundreds of sweaty afternoons and nights there, the Beatles had another home from home, Hamburg. And playing long sessions in the exotic nightclubs there also formed a big part of their apprenticeship. When we came back to Liverpool, and instead of playing six, seven hours a night, all we had to do was compress it and play an hour. You've got all that energy pent up and it just exploded. And of course, the kids had never seen anything like that before. Returning to the cavern in summer 1961, after a three-month Hamburg stint, the Beatles were a battle-hardened unit with a sharp new image to boot. They came back in black leather. They had leather bomber jackets, black turtleneck sweater. Black leather pants and pointed Italian shoes. The new look was modelled on one of the Beatles' rock and roll heroes. We wanted to be like Gene Vincent, you know, we wanted to be rockers. What became Stuff that we'd wear for knocking around became our stage gear, basically. We lived in it. We wore it on stage, we wore it off stage. Um, so leathers became a trademark with us. Hard on the heels of the leather look came a new mop-top hairstyle, for the front three anyway. Soon to be adopted the world over, the Cavernites were unsure about it at first. Nobody wore their hair forward apart from, you know, unfortunate kids at school who got their hair cut by the dad's using a pudding basin. And there was a kid on our estate, and he, very early on, after seeing the Beatles, combed his hair forward. He got beaten up on our estate. I mean, it was that, you know, it was that odd a thing to do. But the biggest breakthrough for the Beatles was that in Hamburg, they had cut their first record. They had provided backing on the rocked-up version of a kid's favorite, sung by Tony Sheridan, an expat Brit, big in Germany. And this was to have a seismic effect on the Beatles' career back home. Enter Brian Epstein, owner of Liverpool's foremost record shop at the time, NEMS. Brian always said he could get uh, a record anywhere in the world. It might take a long time. And we kept getting asked for this record by the Beatles. We got it. We sold boxes and boxes and boxes of it. One day, Brian came into, into NEMS and he said, Alistair, do you remember that band that um, we sold all those records for, the Beatles? So I said, yes. He said, well, they're playing the Cavern Club. One Thursday lunchtime in November 1961, nine months after the Beatles' Cavern debut, Epstein and Taylor made the two-minute walk from the record shop to see them play. I remember the day Brian Epstein came down to the Cavern. We were here then. It was a lunchtime, and Bob Waller had announced over the... Microphone, please welcome Mr. Epstein from NEMS. Sweet little 16. She got the gone up. And I remember actually thinking how old Brian looked at the time, you know, because we were so young ourselves. And he, I mean, I think he was 27 or something when he came down here. She'll have to change it. It's quite um, very posh, dressed very well, immaculately dressed, and um, just a businessman. He was awfully posh, which would have never been with the plebs like us. And he came down at us. All these great children down there, dancing and smoking. And... But he loved the raunchiness and the aggression. At the end, Paul announced that they'd like to close with a number that he and John had written. It's called Hello, Little Girl. I thought, if they can write songs as good as that, you know, and I thought no more. That was just casual thought in my own head. We just put our head down the door, Brian did, and just all he said was, you know, this is my, my assistant, Alistair. And they just, I think they said, you know, what brings you here? And we just said, thought you were very good, bye. It was as quick and as simple as that. Then we went to Peacock's, which, for lunch. Brian says, you know, what do you think of them? And I said, I think they're absolutely diabolical, but magic, absolutely fabulous. 
Out of the blue, he just said, I think I could manage them. The answer was a resounding yes. And from early 1962, with an ambitious new manager at the helm, life for the Beatles started to change in more ways than one. They started doing what we call nice boohings. And he said, well, this leather gear has got to go. So rock and roll leather was out, and showbiz suits were in. When you look back, they were nice suits. They weren't the glitzy, gold lamy things that, you know, people were wearing. They were dark blue mohair, nice cut on them, you know, white shirts, black tie. So, yeah, we looked dapper. Under Epstein's management, record labels were being courted, although without much success at first. And more shows outside Liverpool when the rest of Britain started to discover what all the fuss was about. Hey, 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 hey. But a more controversial change was also coming, one that took the regulars at the cabin by surprise. We got called to Brian Epstein's office one day. As we got up there, we, we opened, uh, Pete Best came out the lift and when pushed us out the way. And we went, hello, how are you doing? And he just wouldn't speak to us. Looked right through us. Pushed us out the way and walked past. And then the secretary came out and said, uh, Brian's uh, can't see you now. Awful sorry, he'll explain later. Yeah, he'll explain later. And apparently he was so upset about the whole thing. He just sacked Pete. He just minister. sacked Pete Best. Just a bombshell being dropped on me, basically. No forewarning. Um, called into, you know, Epi's office. Um, he wasn't a no, normal, cool, calm, placid Brian. Um, because I'd had meetings with Brian before. I'd handled the business side of things. And I just thought, OK, it's another brain-picking session. You know, here we go. You know, what's it like playing for this promoter? Should we put the price up? The usual stuff. Um, we walked in, happy as Larry. Brian was a little bit apprehensive and talked around the subject for a while and then he just said, Pete, I've got bad news for you. Don't really know how to turn around and tell you. The boys want you out and it's already been arranged that Ringo would join the band on Saturday. And that was the bombshell. After two years and more than a thousand shows in Hamburg and Liverpool, Pete Best was out and Ringo Starr from Rory Storm and the Hurricanes was in. And I accepted it, and it was only really when I got back home again that the reality of the situation hit me. Good God, I'm no longer with the band. As to the reason why, there are many well-worn theories. From jealousy of Pete's female following, to his not adopting the Beatles' haircut, to his quietness on stage. There's that many conspiracy theories over it. I stopped worrying about it many, many years ago, you know. Life goes on. If you keep looking back over your shoulder all the time, then you, you know, you will end up bitter and twisted. But there's more to life than that, you know. Yeah, it happened. But take it on the chin and get on with your life. Peter gone, but the Beatles juggernaut powered on, with TV companies starting to pick up on the buzz from the cabin. So as it happened, Ringo's first lunchtime session as a member of the Beatles in August 1962 was filmed by an ITV crew. It's the only footage of the Beatles at the cavern and captures irate Pete Best fans, furious that some other guy was occupying the drum stool. Mixed emotions, obviously, because everyone loved Pete. People were booing and stuff like that. The audience were chanting, Pete Best forever, Ringo never. period in summer 1962, the former cavern idols found themselves the villains of the piece in the eyes of the devotees of their former drummer. George came in with the big black eye and what's happened to you? He said, oh, someone's annoyed that, that we've sacked Pete, so they give me a punch. <laughs> Whether he was any better or worse than Ringo, to be honest, but uh, personality-wise, Ringo fits is a lot better, I think. Because the other three were quite extrovert, and Pete wasn't. 
and Ringo was the clown as well, and he, he did fit in with the Beatles' image. With Ringo, he's, he's so cute. <laughs> he just grew on people, so then he was accepted. Once Ringo had won over the doubters, the classic Beatles lineup was in place. But gone for good were the days of the Beatles as a kind of cavern house band, playing three lunchtime sessions a week. As 1962 drew to an end, TV bookings were on the increase, and most crucially, a record contract had been secured with the MI. Love, love me do. The Beatles were taking you off. Know I love you. Cause for celebration at the cavern? Well, not exactly. So please, love me do. If any band was going to make it, I thought it would be the Beatles. But when it happened, it was like, hang on, they're going. Love, love me do. You know. It felt to me that they would just stay in Liverpool. I mean, nobody got a record contract in those days. You had to go to London and sing songs written by Lionel Bass or something like, something like that, you know, to get a record contract. So I thought the Beatles were going to be here forever. I was aware of a reluctance of the girls to buy Love Me Do because they didn't want the Beatles to leave Liverpool. Hang on, we buy this, or if they get famous, they, they'll leave the cabin and <gasps> what we do then? But I couldn't resist. I worked over the record shop as well, so I couldn't resist, could I? So I've got a very nice signed copy of that still today. Love me a lot of people are disappointed, yeah, because London had their own people. You know, like Cliff Richards and Marty Wilde. And that's all we had in Liverpool, really, the Beatles. So when there was talk about them going, you know, I just unhooked myself and went and done something else. Some of the fans have been saying that, you know, they feel that you've deserted them. What do you feel well, about mainly that? mainly the ones that never came to us. The people that are moaning about us not being here are people that never even came to see us when we were here. Some you know, we we could count on our fingers the, the original fans mm. we had here, the ones that really followed us. Without the Beatles, the fans would find themselves protesting to keep the band's spiritual home alive. So we got all the chairs, and like there was, we say, the entrance there, and we just filled it with chairs. But would it all be in vain? Isn't that typical to knock something iconic down? Close your eyes, and I'll kiss you. 1963 saw Britain gripped by Beatlemania. As hysteria levels surged ever higher nationwide, time spent by the Beatles in their Liverpool hometown became ever more scarce. But in August 1963, a triumphant final return was planned to the place where it all began, the cavern. The final gig here. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, we came in, couldn't get in. I packed, we could not get in the doorway. It was absolutely packed. It was just horrendous, really. It was too, it was too full. Mm -hmm. Too full and a bit frightening. That was a strange night because when we were in the dressing room with the Beatles and they were sitting around all with long faces, and I remember John kept saying, you know, we shouldn't have done this, you know, we shouldn't have come back to do it. It's all going to go wrong. We went on, did our spot. It went great. We, we came off. Anyway, they went on, didn't they? Yeah. And with how long was it? After three one minutes. number, three, three minutes. Yeah, one number. We did one number. And all the lights went out. Everything fused. And John was shouting, I knew we shouldn't have done it. I knew we shouldn't have come back to do this. And they went in, they they went into a little ad lib, John and Paul. Uh, and we didn't know what it was. We thought it was an old 20s song. We only found out like three years later when they did Sgt. Pepper. Yeah, yeah. That it was, um, when I get older, losing my head, many years from that. They actually did it on the last gig on the cabin here. Will you still be sending me a Valentine? Birthday greetings, bottle of wine. 
We never did get them back. Despite what Brian Epstein said, he said, you shall have them again, Bob. Of course, we never got them back again. Oh, yeah, i tell you something. I think you'll understand. The Beatles had outgrown their old stamping ground. The kind of fun they used to have down in the deep, dark cavern was now more likely to take place under TV lights, swapping witty lines with entertainment A-listers of the day. The television people said, would you like to come to Manchester and do a, a quick interview with the Beatles? And we just started chatting about a different thing. I said, well, I'd like to, I think I'd like to have a go at this pop singer myself. Have you no ambitions to form a group yourself? Love to, love to, with the boys. Yeah, Kenny and the Cockroaches. Well, no, coaches. I mean, I, Kenny and the Cockroaches. <laughs> The only thing is I'd have to the change Darby my name, you see. I couldn't just be Ken Dodd, could I? I'd have to have a... Like, you're, you're the Beatles. I'd have to have a name like Cliff or Rock, something earthy. Well, I don't know, eh? Gosh, oh. Cliff Dodd. No. <laughs> Rock Dodd. No, let's invite suggestions for an earthy name for me. Yeah, well, what about that for yeah. Eh? Sod. <laughs> <laughs> they were still able to be down to earth. They were still able to be for Liverpool lads. But the cavern success story wouldn't be just about the Beatles. People in London had heard about you. They'd heard about the Beatles. Let's get up to Liverpool. And, you know, the rest is history, isn't it? So very Once the floodgates had been opened, a wave of other Mersey bands would sweep all before them. And here I I mean, Liverpool about crazy. Beatles, number one. What's number one? The Beatles, then us and the Sages. And there was all Liverpool in the charts and everybody was over the moon. We were blase, but we just accepted it. Oh, another Mersey Beat band at number one. The place I love. This is Liverpool, this is what we do. More and more groups from outside Liverpool were drawn to the club that made Axe famous. Mancunians like the Hollies and Herman's Hermits regularly made the short journey westward. Others, like Londoners, the Kinks, travelled from further afield. When the Kinks made their Cavern debut in 1964, that great English songwriter, Ray Davis, was still reliant on cover versions, like his take on Little Richard's Long Tall Sally. By the mid 60s, Pilgrimage to the Beatles' former musical home was a must for up-and-coming stars like the Kinks. But on the rare occasions that the Beatles themselves returned to Liverpool, a visit to the cavern was no longer on the agenda. July 10th, 1964, saw Liverpool host the northern premiere of the Beatles' first feature film, and the frenzied scenes of fainting teenagers that had been sweeping the country were about to engulf their hometown. So why on earth should I know? For some reason, I'd forgotten that it was the premiere of Odd Day's Night. And I came up, rushing up the underground steps. And I, I just couldn't move. There was this fantastic kind of wall. Of, and then I realised, oh, it's, it, this must be for the people. Now the Beatles were coming on the balcony. We were going on the balcony and we were just in the room at the back and we went near, you know, to look. And I just, I, my mouth fell open. I couldn't believe the amount of people in Castle Street. It was just shocking. I was, oh, I was probably halfway down Castle Street. It was a hell of a crush. Still the casualties mount up. They've been put at about a hundred by the St. John Ambulance men. They're falling like ninepins. Liverpool's never seen anything like this. And here they are. 
The Beatles came out and they looked like four puppets with their suits on and their hairs just so. They look so different from how I remember them. Completely changed. They look like well brought sort up of respectable little boys, not what I remember. <laughs> Less than kind of two years previously, myself along with a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people absolutely loved them, but suddenly this entire city was brought to a standstill. But for all the continued success of its most famous sons, Mersey Beat was on the wane, and so was the cavern. People try to put us to death. London bands like The Who, Kevin performance themselves in 1965, were on the up. Liverpool was becoming old hat. What went wrong? The Liverpool bands stopped having hit records. You know, the only ones who carried on having hit records were the Beatles, really. Until one February evening in 1966, the staff gathered to hear a dramatic announcement from the Kevin club owner, Ray McFall. One night, Sunday night, Ray McFall comes down and says, the bailiffs will be here tomorrow morning. Keep open all night. Let anybody in for the last night. We got round all the clubs in Liverpool and we said, the cavern's closing tonight, but we're not going to close. If you want to come down, come down. We're going to stay playing here till we get thrown out. A few of us got together and we decided that we'd barricade ourselves in. So we got all the chairs, and like there was, we say the entrance there out, and just filled it with chairs, and thought we, you know, we were very brave. We were down here for hours. The groups played for free. There was everyone down there, Christ James, Rory Storm, and the member and Billy Butler was here. All the hideaways, all played, just kept playing, jamming. And towards the morning, I went on stage to tell the kids, when the bailiffs arrived, resist them. But when the police arrived, that's it. Next morning, in came the bailiffs and the police. Time for the evicted Cavanites to take to the streets. We led the protest march around town. There were sheets held on poles with painted on keep the cavern open and stuff like that. And there must have been six, seven, eight hundred of us marched all through the city centre. And I always remember we sang the Yardbeard song, Still I'm Sad. It was easy going, ah. It seemed the right thing for it. When we got into Matthew Street, I got hoisted up on, on top of the cavern doorway and we laid a wreath there. And that wreath stayed there till it died. People power was to win the day. The kids' campaign got its reward when new investment saw a revamped Cavern Club open in style in summer 1966. Where's the most famous number 10 in the world? Downing Street? Not on your Nelly, say Liverpudlians. It's 10 Matthew Street, the address of the Cavern, where the Beatles took the pop world by storm. A new look, super with it, extended Cavern, was being opened by the Premier. And here he was, in the cellar, where it all began. They cut the ribbon, of course, and that, we, then we did look set. Over now to those local idols, the hideaways. The cavern was embarking on a new chapter. We came on the second wave. Those six, seven years younger we were, that's the difference. But the cavern was still, to me, still great. We started making changes then as well. We built another floor upstairs, we had a boutique upstairs, we served food upstairs. I was still playing music downstairs, because you still had some good bands on. As the 60s reached their end, the sounds floating up the steps into Matthew Street were growing ever heavier. Joining the likes of Rod Stewart and Elton John, who both trod the famous boards before making it big, were Queen, who played one of their earliest gigs at the Cavern in 1970. The Beatles really were our heroes, and playing the Cavern 
was quite special for us. The place itself is fascinating because, of course, you think it's going to be something rather grand because it's world famous, but it's tiny and you're playing under these little arches. Um, it's like I'm sort of being in, a, in an underpass, really. <laughs> but as the new decade wore on, the cavern seemed to many a relic of a bygone age. If, like me, you're old enough to remember the big three, but too young to have qualified as a teddy boy, then you should feel a twinge of nostalgia today. Because at the end of the month, they're closing down the Cavern Club here in Liverpool. In fact, they're going to build an underground railway under what probably is the most famous shrine to Mersey mania. Maybe just like everything else runs its course in history, you know, like the Roman Empire. <laughs> I know that's a much bigger thing, but Things sometimes just run the course and people don't want them anymore. We actually couldn't believe it. We thought, what a stupid thing. We thought if the cavern would have been in America, it would have been a shrine. To break your heart in two, to know she's been untrue. Isn't that typical to knock something iconic down? and, you know, replace it with a, a railway shaft. In June 1973, the cavern was demolished. There weren't any marches or any mass protests or anything like that. It was just accepted that was the end of an era. It was supposed to be getting closed because there was going to be a shaft drilled for the uh, Underground Railway. But I don't think they ever did it. They just filled it in. Setting suns before they fall. Well, I just thought somebody's made a mistake. I thought it's silly. They could have made a fortune out of the cabin. Americans loved it. Everybody loved it. Just seemed a silly thing to do. After all. When tourists visited the iconic Matthew Street site, all that was left for them to take photos of was a car park where the cavern once stood. It's it seemed that the cavern story was over. But was it? On December the 9th, 1980, Britain awoke to bad news. He's not dead. They're just saying that to get people to leave. He's not dead. John Lennon can't be dead. I think it was such a shock. Well, to those of us who knew him, it was a shock. Um, it was quite a surprise to realize the rest of the world felt the same. Strangers sort of crying and things like this, and it did sort of make us all wake up a little bit, really. It was probably the assassination of John Lennon in 1980, which I think was the catalyst. Liverpool became somewhere to do a pilgrimage to. But devotees seeking the legendary cavern, where it all began for John Lennon and his fellow Beatles, were in for a shock. All they found was a rubble-strewn car park. There was no Mersey Beat Mecca to visit. Although confusingly, there was a club on the other side of the street with the old cavern sign outside it. The then owner, Roy Adams, decided that he wasn't going to let the cavern be buried underground. So what he did was reopen a premises across the street um, and called it the Cavern Club, where it remained for a couple of years. The club changed its name from the Cavern to the Revolution and subsequently changed its name for a third time to Eric's. And in 1976, you walked in this doorway into a club that became Liverpool's iconic punk club. Just metres away from where the Cavern once stood was a new club housing the musical stars of a new generation. Nice girls, that one with a defect, so a fan shrink, grab so correct. 
Red Fox Thunder The Eric's flame burned briefly, and its doors closed for the last time in 1982. But by then, plans were afoot to bring the most famous club name of them all back to Matthew Street. The cavern would rise again. Immediately opposite this doorway now, you have the entrance to the new cavern club, which was rebuilt and reopened in 1984. So we're about 22 foot underground, about eight foot deeper than it was in its heyday. This is the Cavern Club today, and uh, it's been rebuilt exactly as the original looked. We even have the original bricks on the ceiling and the archways. People walk in the door today. They expect to hear the music that was familiar to them of that period in the 60s, and, and that's what we do. The cavern is lower than it was, it's different, it's right at right angles to the old place. As I remember the cavern, but it's a very good facsimile, it really is. And it smells better too. It's still a venue that a lot of successful artists want to play now. The new cavern also boasts a second stage where contemporary acts play. Today, 50 years after the Beatles played their first gig in the most famous club in the world, the cavern lives on. But with the passing of the years, many of the leading lights of the cavern's heyday are no longer with us, and the memories this iconic venue evokes are bittersweet. I look at you all, see the love that's sleeping, while my guitar gently weeps. So many people gone now. And the main ones, two Beatles, two wives, all the parents. That's life, isn't it? Time moves on. Gently weeps. Seems hard to believe that, you know, I'm still alive. And that two of the Beatles are, are dead. If they hadn't become famous, they'd probably be alive, I suppose. They used to chain smoke on stage, you know, and I think that's what's happened to George. I don't have to explain about John, if he wasn't in New York, then he might still be alive. Besides George, you know, uh, and John, John, of course, um, there's a lot of other bands that were resident here that are not with us anymore. A lot of great friends. Yeah. who have gone that we first saw here. Recent years have seen the passing of key figures in the story of the cavern's golden era. We must surely be learning Still my guitar But the music first heard at the cavern lives on. We've still got Paul. One, two, three. And to mark the millennium, Paul McCartney made an emotional return to where it all began. We stood there like schoolboys again, you know, it was just terrific. And that's where he belonged, the cavern. Even though it wasn't the original stage, it was still a great gig. And it, it was rock and roll. The cavern is so famous around the world now. You go to any country in the world, and what do they want to talk about? The cavern, the Beatles, where it all started. While the reborn cavern goes from strength to strength, its greatest days are preserved in the memories of those who were there. Memories of the Beatles stepping onto its tiny stage. Of the Mersey sound conquering the pop world. Oh, I'll be there. And of DJ Bob Wooler spinning the smalty ballad that always marked the end of another amazing cavern night. To answer your unspoken prayer. 
Bobby Darren disc called I'll Be There. When the little things you're doing. That was always the last record he played, and you knew there was no hope Time after to go. that. You had to go. Don't you worry, darling, I'll be there. The most famous club, I think, in the world is the Cavern. And I can't really see any other club taking it over now because conditions have all changed. And for a small club, I think this is the place and it always will be the place. And wish you luck on your new affair. I love the fact that it's being recreated and it's fantastic that it's there for all those generations who, who weren't in the delightfully fortunate position that I and a few others was in of being in the original cabin. And don't you worry, darling, I'll be there. We've come so far now, we're 50 years on from when the cavern opened. I wonder when it will eventually fade away. Will it ever fade away? Certainly not in my lifetime. That there is someone who cares. So if you What a memory. I mean, kids today say, I wish I'd lived through that time, you know. And to think, well, you know, I did. Don't you worry, darling, I'll be there. Refusing to believe it was an accident, Ruth is determined to find out the truth about Alice's death. Our chilling drama continues. Marchelins is tomorrow at 9. Next, international football highlights. Denmark versus England. <laughs>